Inventing Reality, Section. Not enough time, space, and money? All sorts of vital issues go unmentioned in the news media. Try to cover everything that is happening in the world would be impossible, it is argued, because it would be too expensive and there is not enough newsprint space and airtime available. Let us examine this argument. The major media are vast news-gathering organizations with correspondents and stringers around the globe. AP, for instance, has 100 reporters in Washington, D.C. alone. Despite these imposing resources, many revealing stories are broken by small publications with only a fraction of the staff available to the big media conglomerates. The startling news that the CIA was funding cultural, academic, and student organizations was first publicized by the now-defunct Ramparts magazine. Ralph Nader's revelations about the unsafe nature of automobiles were ignored by the mainstream press and first began appearing in The Nation, a low-budget magazine on the liberal left. Journalist Seymour Hersh sent his account of the My Lai Massacre of the Vietnamese villagers by U.S. troops to the little-known Dispatch News Service, after none of the major wire services would pick it up. Stories about hunger in America, the chemical poisoning of our environment, the CIA's involvement in the drug trade, the obstructionist use of the veto by the U.S. at the United Nations, the repeated violations of our civil liberties by government security agencies, including the FBI, the massive corruption and criminal conspiracies behind the savings and loan scandal, the ferocious wars of counterinsurgency and death squad terrorism sponsored by the U.S. in Central America and elsewhere, and other such revelations were uncovered by poorly financed radical publications or other small media long before they were picked up, if ever, by the major news organizations. Subsection, the media censor, quote, project censored. Each year, quote, project censored, a panel of media critics picks 10 stories that have appeared in smaller publications, but have been ignored by major media and kept from the general public. Among the censored stories in recent years were that the U.S. cast the only negative vote in the United Nations against a resolution endorsing a treaty to outlaw nuclear weapons, that some leading U.S. corporations had sympathized and done extensive business with Nazi Germany during World War II, that nearly all chemical fertilizers used in recent years, amounting to $2 billion a year, were found to be worthless by researchers, that the U.S. military supervised the massive aerial bombardment of civilian populations in El Salvador, that for more than a decade the U.S. has supported the Indonesian military campaign of genocide in East Timor, that links exist between missing savings and loan funds, organized crime, and CIA operatives, that the Pentagon has a secret, quote, black budget, used to conceal the costs of expensive and controversial military weapons, that NASA shuttles destroy the ozone shield. The Project Censored report issued yearly by its director Carl Jensen from Sonoma State University, California, is itself almost entirely ignored by the corporate-owned media. End subsection. Regarding the broadcast media, 22 minutes of televised evening news, with 8 minutes for commercials and station breaks, simply do not allow enough time for anything more than, quote, snapshot and headline services, it is said. Yet, despite such limitations, network news finds plenty of time for frivolous subjects, intended to entertain rather than to inform. If the evening news were expanded to one hour, this would not guarantee more depth coverage. If anything, the repetitious and evasive surface quality of television news would become more evident, and an hour more unsatisfying, 
as demonstrated by the local TV news shows that now offer hour-long programs. Time is not an ironclad determinant of content. In five minutes, one could make devastating and in-depth revelations and connections on any number of issues. But how often would a network news team attempt to do so? News media supposedly have a penchant for stories that are simple and sensational, and thereby easily grasped by a large audience. But there are many simple and quite sensational stories that remain untouched. For instance, in October 1982, the media gave sensational coverage to several deaths caused when someone slipped poison into Tylenol capsules that were later sold in stores. Yet these same media ignored the far greater number of deaths, 97 abroad and 27 in the United States, caused when Eli Lilly and company marketed an, quote, anti-arthritis pill called Oroflex. The Food and Drug Administration allowed Oroflex to go on sale in April 1981, despite an FDA investigator's earlier report indicating that Lilly was withholding data on the dangerous side effects of the drug. Here was a sensational story of mass murder and skullduggery, of possible corporate malfeasance and government collusion. Yet, the press did not bother with it. Why the difference in handling the two stories? The Tylenol killings seem to have been the work of a deranged individual. The corporate manufacturer and advertisers could not be blamed. Unlike the Lilly case. Therefore, the Tylenol story was not only sensational, but safe, free from any criticism of the marketing ethics of drug advertisers and of big business in general. As noted in Chapter 1, some critics say the problem of superficial coverage rests with the journalists themselves. A president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, Newbold Denoise, once remarked that reporters are, quote, lazy and superficial, habitually treating official events and reports as news, quote, while the real situation behind these surface things go unnoted, end quote. But is it really just a matter of laziness and inertia? Behind the superficiality of the news, there stands a whole configuration of power and interest that makes the lazy, conventional way of presenting things also the politically safer, less troublesome way. Noyce seems to hint at this when he adds, quote, I think the worst of our lazy and superficial performance today is that we of the press are allowing ourselves to be manipulated by various interests. End quote. But again, it is not the laziness that is allowing the manipulation. It is the manipulative control that encourages and rewards the lazy, superficial, quote, objective approach. Correspondents who report on third world revolutionary insurgencies by ensconcing themselves in a luxury hotel, waiting for handouts from the U.S. Embassy, or from the military junta that is trying to destroy the insurgency, may be guilty of laziness. But they are also producing copy their editors and publishers find acceptable. When one of them does otherwise, he or she may run into difficulties. When Herbert Matthews reported the Cuban Revolution directly from the field, offering detailed accounts of popular support the guerrillas enjoyed and the early accomplishments of the revolutionary government, he was removed from the story by the New York Times. Matthews had unique access to the Cuban leadership. As he himself mourns, quote, Here was one of the rare phenomena of modern history, a social revolution of the most drastic kind, on which I, and I alone, could report from the inside, as it went along. It was a golden opportunity for the New York Times. But I was muzzled. End quote. 
Matthews was silenced on the Cuban issue because his reports were not sufficiently in step with the anti-Castro, anti-communist tidal wave that was flooding the media. Far from being lazy, he showed himself to be the go-getter par excellence, and for that he got into difficulties with his employers. If reporters hold back and allow themselves to be manipulated by vested interests, it is because they have learned that such behavior has its rewards, and a more challenging kind of journalism has its punishments. Almost two decades later, a Washington Post reporter, Alma Guillermo Prieto, and another New York Times reporter, Ray Bonner, learned the same lesson. When they began producing stories for their respective newspapers about how the U.S.-supported military in El Salvador massacred unarmed peasants, they were both pulled out of that country. Guillermo Prieto was eventually let go, and Bonner resigned, noting that his experience had a chilling effect on, quote, many other reporters, who told him, quote, I don't want the same thing to happen to me. I'm going to be careful. End quote, and end of section.